um, our uh, talks here. Let me just see if I can. Cool. Theological implications of alternative models of origins. I'm sure if you've been listening to the uh, to the talks here um, over the last uh, day and a half, uh, you will have noticed, you would have picked up uh, that there's a there's a spectrum of origins positions, and um, uh, perhaps if you you haven't been listening, you might might not have picked up on some of these. But I just wanted to to kind of lay that spectrum out, and um, so. Uh, on one side of the spectrum, you've got the, the young universe, young life uh, position, uh, which is that the, the entire universe and, um, and life itself began, was created by God uh, about six to 10,000 years ago. And, and then you, you move through, you've got an older universe. Uh, so the universe itself is older, uh, but the, the galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy or uh, the, the solar system is, is young um, and also life itself is young. So that's the, the next uh, point there. Um, the next uh, line on the, the spectrum is older young life. So that's the, the Earth itself has, has been around uh, for, for, for a longer period of time beyond the creation week. But life itself was, was created in, in six literal days. Uh, fairly recently. So all of those are on the, uh, the young life uh, side of the spectrum. And then we start to go deeper into deep time and uh, the, the next uh, the line in the spectrum is progressive creationism. And uh, we'll be talking about that as well. But progressive creationism is the, the concept that, that God progressively created life over uh, the, the 4.54 billion years uh, which geology, geological uh, dating models say that the Earth has been around. And then finally, at the, the other end of the spectrum, you've got theistic evolution, or some people like to call it evolutionary creationism. So I guess it's where you want to put the emphasis. Do you, do you want the emphasis or the, the final thing to be on evolution, or do you want it to be on creation? Uh, but effectively, they, they are the same, uh, same thing. And um, there's a th few things to notice. First of all, you'll notice that if you go towards the, the right-hand side to the young universe, uh, there's less standard uh, scientific conclusions which are accepted for our origins. Um, as you go to the, the left-hand side, um, we accept more and more of, of them. The other thing to, to note as well is that it also has to do with the age. So on this side of the spectrum, you have more young entities. Um, everything's young on this side. And as you go across the spectrum, uh, those, those spectral lines, you get more and more older um, entities. Now, I like to put it as a bit of a grid because it kind of, you see an interesting pattern here. So if we put those same, uh, those same positions, those same origins positions together with the, the different um, scientific conclusions or different di scientific uh, disciplines, you see an interesting pattern, um, which is that you see more and more rejection of them as you go towards the young universe, young life side. So uh, young universe, young life position would reject Big Bang cosmology, uh, would reject standard geological dating models, uh, standard pa paleontological dating models, and also neo-Darwinian -Darwin evolution and uh, common biological ancestry. So the lot. Um, as you come across, you, you do uh, reject a number of them. Some of them with the gray bar is, is just non-committal. So if you are a person who believes in an older universe, but a young galaxy and young life, um, you're, not, you're not committed to the Big Bang. You prob probably don't commit to the Big Bang. Uh, but uh, you, um, you definitely reject uh, the geological dating uh, models and time um, as well, deep time. And you come back across, so for example, old Earth, young life um, is not necessarily committed to Big Bang cosmology, is not necessarily committed to standard geological dating uh, models, but it definitely rejects um, the, the dating of the fossils and also uh, that life as well. Progressive creationism, as you see, accepts cosmology, Big Bang cosmology, uh, geological uh, dating models and the fossil uh, dating. And of course, uh, theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism accept all of them. 
Now, it's, um, what we want to do is we want to uh, assess, in particular, the, the theological implications of these, these models. And what I want to tell you is this. First of all, um, I, I uh, taught one of the uh, class, a guest seminar here together with Ross and uh, put all of these positions out and, and some of the, uh, the uh, students were, were quite interested to find out that these positions are represented in the Adventist church. Uh, so that was very interesting for them as well. But I do want to say this, is that there is actual value that this spectrum does exist. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Well, it's not because I'm non-committal. Uh, to any one particular. Indeed, for me personally, I hold to an old universe, but a young galaxy and solar system and uh, young life position myself, based on my study of, of um, Genesis 1 and Exodus 20 as well. So, so that's my position. So it's not a case of, of not being committed um, to a particular position. But um, I was recently listening to a, a podcast um, by William Lane Craig, um, one of the, the well-known apologists around the, the world, and, and they were interacting with an atheist in Canada. And this, um, this uh, guy, this, this um, gentleman, um, had been a, a teacher, like a youth leader, um, in, in the, his church, evangelical church, for, and he'd been in church for 30 years. So he was, he was, a, he was not a, a teenager, he was not a university student, he was well into uh, his prime of life. Um, and what he found out was he discovered that dinosaurs existed and that, that science has said that they date back millions of years. And, and when he found that out, his, his whole worldview was shattered. And he turned all the way to atheism and has become a very active online vlogger um, uh, challenging uh, Christianity and faith itself, the existence of God. And so what this, this spectrum allows us to do is it, it, it allows us to actually say that there are, there are alternatives that we can consider that people don't need to reject um, God altogether um, just because they come up against some things in, in science. However, however, it is very important, it is very important that we do assess um, these theologically. Now, uh, let me be clear that the, the last three um, options, in particular, we are going to be looking at in our next seminar, next conference in two years, so there's a bit of a teaser and a trailer. Uh, so if you want to uh, come back in, in a couple of years roughly, and uh, we'll be looking at, at those. Uh, but I want to look at the, uh, the, the first two. Now you might say, well, you know, we just, why don't we just look at the evidence? Why don't we just uh, focus on, on the, the biology and uh, uh, the, the fossil records and, and dating models and all that kind of stuff. Well, first of all, I'd bring you back to, to what Leonard Brand said yesterday. The fact is this, is in terms of your position on this spectrum, ultimately it is not the evidence that is the ultimate um, issue. It is ultimately your philosophy. It's your world's view, which is the actual issue. And you may remember that I also mentioned um, in, my, in my first talk uh, that as William Lane Craig and J.P. Morland said, uh, that the, the issue here between the conversation here is not about the scientific evidence. In fact, um, uh, you know, you could, Francis Collins, who, who was the director of the Human Genome Project, he said, he, looking at the, the, um, the evolutionary tree, um, he said, I cannot deny the fact, based on the evidence, that God did not... Uh, specially create um, uh, animal life according to the way the Bible described it. Based on the evidence, you can't decide. So we need to look at a different, different area. We need to also consider the theo uh, theological implications as well. And it is very important. Let me give you another example, um, which is why we need to bring in the moral implications and the theological implications as well. So for example, it's the, the traditional idea um, in, in Christendom has been that, that, uh, that hell is eternal, that God um, uh, torments people uh, throughout eternity. 
um, based on their rejection of, of Jesus Christ. Now, as the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, for those of you who are part of it, obviously know, for those of you who aren't aware, we have uh, rejected that and, and go um, understand it to be a conditional um, immortality. Why do we do that? Well, definitely we do it based on biblical data. We, we do it on biblical data. Uh, but we also, we also look at the moral implications. Is it morally consistent with the God of the Bible? And, and we can legitimately bring that into the, the picture as well. There, there's a third thing too, which is very important as well, is that what is the theological system on which eternal torment in hell is based? It is actually based on platonic dualism. Platonic dualism, which is where you, know, you have um, good and evil um, effectively lasting throughout eternity. So because, um, because wicked people have an immortal soul based on dualism, we need to actually send them somewhere. God needs to do something with them. So, of course, they need to go into eternal torment because they can't get into to heaven. If platonic dualism is, is an incorrect theological system and it's morally inconsistent with the Bible, together with biblical data, as a whole, we can reject uh, the traditional understanding of, of hell. And I want to do this um, with, with these two alternative positions on um, origin. So first of all, let me take you to theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism. Let me just um, remind you or just clarify what does that mean. So theistic evolution fully integrates um, standard scientific conclusions with theism right across the, the board. Uh, so God was the transcendent cause of the Big Bang um, approximately 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, then galaxies, stars, planets coalesced and formed according to natural processes uh, described by astrophysical laws um, established by God. And then um, God front-loaded uh, the, the universe uh, based on the, the fine-tuning of the, the parameters of the universe um, so that the, the process of evolution uh, would, would get underway, whether it was eventually or, or um, randomly, that's, that's um, uh, an issue in theistic evolution. But, and then God supervised the process of evolution, but he didn't intervene in any empirically detectable way. So, so the, the um, evolution just occurred um, and, and God supervised it. Now, um, at the end of this process, or towards the end of this process, uh, there, was a, there was a human couple, or maybe a group of people, and they, they acquired the property of having the image of, of God. And so that's theistic evolution. That, that's the, the, the principle, or the, the, the description of theistic evolution. And you can go to Francis Collins and, and other people as well um, who, who hold to this uh, position. Now, we could certainly, at this point, we could dive in and we could start to, to dive into critical issues in theistic evolution. And it is very tempting to do that. But I want to step back and, and look at the theological system behind theistic evolution. What is the theological system which theistic evolution is based on? Or, or what is the, um, the, the, the lens, the, the filter, the theological filter that people who accept uh, theistic evolution are actually using to, to arrive at this position. A theological system is a bit like a geometrical uh, system, uh, geometry. Uh, so in, in maths you have Euclidean uh, geometry. It's a mathematical system, but it's not the only system. And um, you have other systems which is like this sort of grid around which all of the things uh, are connected. I want to introduce you to a, a concept, or a, a term, an idea, and it's deism. Has anybody ever heard of deism? Deism, yes. So, uh, so deism, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's a movement or system of thought advocating natural religion, emphasizing morality, so it's not an immoral or amoral um, system, and in the 18th century, denying the interference of crea the creator with the laws of the universe. And uh, Wikipedia, uh, deism is the philosophical belief which posits that although God exists as an uncaused first cause 
ultimately responsible for the creation of the universe. God does not interact directly uh, with that subsequently, subsequently created universe, world. Equivalently, deism can also be defined as a view which asserts God's existence as the cause of all things and admits its perfection and usually the existence of natural law and providence, but rejects divine revelation or direct interference, uh, intervention of God in the universe by miracles. That, that's deism. That's deism. And um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, there's, there's a book that I got recently by Alistair McGrath. And uh, it's called Darwinism and the Divine. And Alastair McGrath is a, effectively a historian of the relationship between uh, science and Christianity. And so what he does is he, he's studied the, the processes, particularly connecting these, uh, these two, science and, and theology. And he's gone back to uh, the, the 17th and 18th century. And there was a marked movement towards deism in England, in, in particular, England, um, but there was also deism obviously elsewhere in Europe and, and United States as well. Um, now, before we get too sort of high and mighty and haughty about this, we have to remember that William Miller spent time as a deist. So he was, um, he was a deist until he started studying uh, Daniel and um, and discovered the, the time prophecies there. But what Alistair McGrath found is this, is that um, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, is where did, where did Deus get this, this idea from? Do they get it from the Bible? Do they get it from the Bible? No, they don't. They don't get it from the Bible. They don't obviously get it from any uh, biblical text or inspired text. And um, he, he traced it back and he, he identified that what was driving deism was a reaction against the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church at that time was wanting to establish its authority and wanting to establish its authority amongst the, the peasants and the, the farmers. And so what they did is that they would appeal to relics and miracles. They would appeal to, to miracles. They, they'd say, you know, this holy water and this person was healed. And so the, the English, uh, wanting to, to overthrow the shackles of, of the Catholic Church, started to move towards deism. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to say, we can see God's power and existence through physical laws, the way God um, uh, uh, built the universe, uh, created the universe. But we, we, don't, we want to avoid miracles um, altogether, because that's what the Catholic Church uses. So we want to stick with the physical laws. The other thing which was happening at that time was um, the Industrial Revolution, and the English were obsessed with machines, steam engines, and, and uh, factories, and things like that. So they looked at the world through a, a um, as a machine-like system, machine-like system that God created sent on its way and it just kept on going. So that's the kind of background, that's, that's where deism really um, kind of uh, grew from, that kind of environment. Now compare this with methodological naturalism. Uh, Eugenie Scott, uh, who I mentioned on Tuesday, science neither denies or, or opposes the supernatural but ignores the spiritual for methodological reasons. And Ernan McMullen, the methodology of natural science give no, gives no purchase on the claim that a particular um, event or type of event is to be explained by invoking God's creative action directly. So, here's my conclusion. For a, for a Christian scientist, not for an atheist, um, not for a Buddhist um, or, or uh, whatever, for a Christian a scientist who is committed to methodological naturalism and as a result theistic evolution, the underlying theological system that they're using is pragmatic deism. Pragmatic deism. That God started the universe, he's the un, uh, uncaused cause, he uh, got the universe going, and the, the rest of history is the outworking of those, those laws. Now, this is what um, Norman Gully um, has recognized as well. He said, the basic assumption that God is removed from nature logically implies a deistic God one who is less than the God of Scripture. This is a, a reduced form of God. Now, this is not to say that God just kind of walked away and left this universe um, to 
uh, to do its stuff that, that he has had no more interaction. For deism, you, you can still have God sustaining the universe, um, but he doesn't interact with the universe. He doesn't, um, we, we don't have inspired scriptures, we don't have, um, we don't have miracles, uh, we don't have any of that activity in, in God, uh, in, in the world. So, of course, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that theistic evolutionists believe wholeheartedly in that, but certainly the assumption when they're coming to theistic evolution is um, pragmatic deism. So, the question again is this, is this the theological system of the Bible, yes or no? No, it is not. It is not the theological system of the Bible. And that's a major, major problem. It's a major, major problem. Uh, because it, um, it is completely different from the biblical worldview. Let me just share with you some uh, comments on the, the theological system which we find in the Bible. And, and these are really beautiful. The Bible contains a simple and complete system of theology and philosophy. It is the book that makes us wise unto salvation. It tells us how to reach the abodes of eternal happiness. It tells us of the love God, of God as shown in the plan of redemption imparting the knowledge essential for, for all, the knowledge of Christ. He is the saint of God. He's the author of our salvation. But apart from the word of God, we could have no knowledge that such a person as the Lord Jesus ever visited our world, nor any knowledge of his divinity, as indicated by his previous existence with the Father. This is not a deistic um, theological system. And I love this one as well. Christ is the complete system of truth. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. All true believers center in Christ. Their character is irradiated by Christ. All meet in Christ and circulate about Christ. Truth comes from heaven to purify and cleanse the human agent from every moral defilement. Is, is God in, involved in our world? Yes, he is. He's involved in, in saving and sanctifying us. Um, for those who believe in Jesus. It leads to benevolent action, to kind, tender, thoughtful love toward the needy, the distressed, the suffering. This is practical obedience to the words of Christ. And let me give you this one as well. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the dis disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present truth as it brought to light the position and work of his people. Light from the sanctuary illuminated, illumined the past, the present, and the future. The sanctuary theological system. This is the system of the Bible. This is the system of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the sanctuary theological system. What do we see in the sanctuary theological system? We see continual work of salvation symbolized by the daily sanctuary services. We also see major historical events symbolized by the annual cal calendar of, of festivals. We see the Passover. God does something during the Passover. We see Pentecost. God is doing something during Pentecost. We see the, the festival of the first fruits. God is doing something involved in our world during the festival of fir uh, first fruits. Day of Atonement. God is involved, deeply involved. And then the, day, um, the festival of the um, tabernacles right at the end where we celebrate. And we can, we can look even beyond this as well, um, one which you'll know well, the great controversy theme. The great controversy theme. What we see in this is that salvation history extends beyond the human horizon. It's, it's, this is the system. So we have these two uh, theological systems, pragmatic deism, where the source of knowledge is empirical observations, assumes that God does not miraculously intervene in creation for the objective of developing natural laws, does not appeal to scriptures as divine revelation and as a source of scientific knowledge. On the other hand, we, we, have, we can have what we call salvation history, the source of knowledge of salvation history. If you want to know about salvation history, you go to sola tota prima scriptura. That's where you go. You don't find it in nature. Uh, God is unfurling his salvation within the spatio-temporal order of his creation. The sanctuary serves as a complete model of salvation history that was divinely revealed to Moses and to John in Revelation. Jesus says, my father is, is always at his work to this very day, and I'm to him working. And that's not just sustaining the universe. It's also he is involved in salvation. So God typically sustains his creation in regular, predict, uh, predictable ways but is also constantly working towards the salvation of human beings. God is not a deistic God. 
He's not a deistic God. God. God performs signs, wonders, and miracles within his creation. So literally, the, the, the um, theological system behind theistic evolution is a restricted view of reality. It means that the scientific evidence base is different from the Christian evidence base. We have the Bible um, as, as a significant source of, of data, um, which, which a, a, a methodological naturalist ignores. The Christian's evidence base includes belief in God as well as belief in the main lines of the Christian faith. The former does not include these things. And Fernando Canali says, the difference boils down to a different index of reality, a different system. Creations have a much broader index of reality than evolutionists. What does it mean? Some implications. First of all, her hermeneutical. There is a significant difference, uh, dis dissimilarity with uh, Genesis 1 to 2 um, and theistic evolution. You, you just can't derive theistic evolution out of the, out of the text. Now, let me be honest. I, I recognize theistic evolutionists are not trying to derive theistic evolution out of the text. They, they see it coming from empirical evidence. But it is an important um, thing. Secondly, Sabbath. Theistic evolution undermines the historical basis for the weekly uh, Seventh-day Sabbath based on, on the salvation history um, system of theology. Sin also is, is a, a big thing. It's eroded by theistic evolution because the very definition of nature of sin um, is, is undermined. Um, death is also, it's a, it's a necessary feature of the very uh, development of life that is required for the diversification of life. It's been occurring for billions of years and is not the result of human uh, sin. But the biggest issue for theistic evolutionists, and this is not just for the Adventist church, um, it's for um, all Christian denominations, is the issue of Adam and Eve. It's, it's a big, big issue. Because within theistic evolution, uh, there was no one single original uh, human couple. Uh, there was, it goes back to a pool of about 10 to 20,000 uh, human beings or hominids that they were living at that time. So there's, there's two possibilities. They never existed because there was a whole group of them at that time. Or maybe God chose two um, as to be specially um, uh, selected as, as uh, representatives for us, but there were, there were many thousands of, of human beings, hominids at that time, who were genetically effectively no different from, from Adam and Eve at that time. They, they were on that continuum. And what this means is there's a number of, of, of issues for Adam and Eve. Uh, Wayne Grudem has, has highlighted these. So first of all, Adam and Eve were not the first human beings and possibly never existed. Number two, they were not handmade directly by God. They were born of human parents. Um, Adam and Eve were never sinless human beings. They, they, they sinned before... Um, before they were selected by God, if they were selected by God at all. And the other thing is human beings have been doing immoral deeds for long before Ad um, Adam and Eve um, came around. Uh, human death did not uh, result, um, uh, begin as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. And um, this is another really important thing. Not all human beings are directly descended from human, uh, Adam and Eve, if they existed. So, so that, that's a really important, significant implication for Adam and Eve. Well, you might be saying, well, tough luck for Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, they, they, they thought they were special, but there was a, a few 10 or 20,000 of them. The issue comes down to the New Testament, where the New Testament uh, paints this incredible parallel between the first man and the last man, the second man, the first Adam and the last Adam. If we spiritualize away Adam and Eve, if they, if they never existed, if, if we are not all related to them, then what does it do to Jesus? What does it do to what he did for us in the cross when he was resurrected back, for, back to life? Was that just a spiritual metaphor? Um, well, did he actually achieve salvation for us? You see, when you put the deistic theological system, you start to erode all of, of salvation as well. We go to the end as well. If a, if a perfect world, 
where there was no sin and death never existed in the past. What does this mean for the Bible's promise of a new earth in the future where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain, where the old order of things have passed away? What does it do? Because it, di it never existed in the past. Will it actually exist in the future? The deistic model of the deistic the um, theological system erodes that significantly. And as Fernando Canali has, has said, if because of sociological, cultural or political reasons, some, Christian, some Adventists continue to believe that Adventist theology should reject Genesis 1 as theological history and accept deep time evolutionary history. They should explain to the rest of the worldwide body of believers the systematic consequences of such a paradigmatic change in theological detail, which they, they have not done. Uh, other implications as well, confidence in Jesus' teachings, because Jesus referred back to the creation account. And, um, and if he did, what does that mean to his knowledge and his references to that? It also um, really uh, addresses the, the issue of the plan of salvation. If humans are the result of progress within natural evolutionary development, uh, then there is no place for their fall, for death through sin, no need of God's law, of divine revelation in scripture, of salvation through Christ, of the new creation work and of the Holy Spirit or of Christ present intercession, second coming or final judgment. And um, it also has an impact on our mission as a church as well, as Seventh-day Adventists and Christians as well. The endorsement of both a recent six-day creation of deep time origins will undermine the effectiveness of our witness. If we go to Wayne Gruder, he's an evangelical Christian, and he says this, in Genesis 1 to 3, scripture teaches the essential truths about the activity of God in creation. The origin of the universe, the creation of plants and animals on the earth, the origin and unity of the human race, the creation of manhood and womanhood, the origin of marriage, the origin of human sin and human death, and man's need for the redemption from sin. Without the foundation laid down in those three chapters, the rest of the Bible would make no sense, and many of those doctrines would be undermined or lost. It is no exaggeration to say that those three chapters are essential to the rest of, of the Bible. And uh, let me just conclude on this. I mean, uh, people who uh, believe in, in theistic evolution would probably say, well, that's, that's a slippery slope argument. We don't have to go all the way. But the question is, we need, we need to ask ourselves, well, where do we stop using the pragmatic, deistic, theological system? Where do we stop? And um, I have talked, I've, I've spoken at length with a uh, theistic evolutionist here in Australia um, who, who doesn't, doesn't live around here um, or, or nearby. And, um, and we've spoken and he said to me, you know, he does not believe that Jesus cast out demons and, and um, healed people from demon um, oppression. Why not? Because his theological system actually disallows him to do that. And um, unfortunately, I was going to talk to, to you about progressive creation as well, but my time is up. So I'll have to pass it over to, uh, to Anthony. So thank you very much. Okay, so you guys have just had lunch, haven't you? This is like the graveyard shift if you're doing a lecture. And um, so maybe stand up. Yeah, yeah, stand up and do some stretching, some exercising. It's nice. Yep. Get some oxygen in. Yeah. <laughs> And if you want to have a seat. Uh, thanks for that. <clears throat> okay, so my talk is the moral implications of death before sin. Now, um, you know, my, my wife and I, we've always tried to sort of minimize the amount of uh, time our children spend in front of a, a screen, whether it be an iPhone or a tablet or a computer or a 
TV or anything. Um, but we, 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 we allow our children to watch some things. Um, and we noticed early on, particularly young children are really sensitive to what they watch. And particularly if there's dramatic music. Have you noticed that? And uh, once they were watching um, a pretty harmless episode, I think it was the Octonauts. Anyone who has kids? You, who loves the Octonauts? Oh, I love the Octonauts. Great show. And it's, it's usually pretty harmless, but there was this, this moment where well, something a little bit scary was happening and the music came on and, and our kids are like, ah, Dad, <laughs> we don't want to watch this. And it's, it's terrible because they, they can't watch it, but they can't look away. That's the, that's the thing. So I came over and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, um, we'll, we'll watch something different. And I thought, oh, okay, what do I, what do I get them to watch? And then I thought, oh, I know, I'll get them to watch a, a lovely nature documentary. <laughs> so that, that's going to be perfect. And um, so, yeah, so I, I put on this uh, beautiful um, nature documentary. And I, I don't know what I was thinking or not thinking. And later on, my wife was like, what were you thinking? <laughs> so anyway, they are watching the the delightful adventures of a cute little mammal. I can't remember what it was. And they are just loving it. It's beautiful, the cinematography, the, oh, everything is just glorious. And um, then all of a sudden, this, this, this scene changed to horror and tears. And like, ah, as a predator started to mercilessly stalk this little cute mammal. And, um, Basically, I had to just run, get over there as quick as possible <laughs> and try and uh, change the scene because, um, again, they, they couldn't watch but they couldn't look away. And uh, I think we switched to an episode of Play School after that, yeah. <laughs> Which is it's a great show. But I love nature documentaries. Um, the, and I'm, I'm sure you do as well. The world of creation is a source of endless awe and wonder. It's also an unrelentingly dangerous and frightening place for its inhabitants. Um, and I still wince um, when I, I just recall watching um, a video like this of cackling hyenas um, basically uh, eating um, the hind parts in the mid midsection of an, a zebra, or it might have been a... Um, Wildebeest, while the, the agonizing and helpless animal is still alive. And now, this picture here, this is one of the less gruesome ones. There was all these others, and I'm like, no, I can't show that one. I can't show this one. But I know you've had lunch, um, but... <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's actually terrible, but this, this zebra is actually pregnant as well. And uh, so you, you, you look at this, and, and this, is, this is really stomach-turning, to be honest. And I actually, this sort of stuff I can't actually watch. This, you know, that sort of level of grotesque is, is really hard to watch. But this is actually the norm in nature. This is actually the norm. It's not the exception. It's there all the time, all the way uh, through it. So creation is beautiful and terrifying all at the same time. Now, this wasteful, cruel, death-saturated state of the natural world was not lost on a very observant um, a naturalist by the name of Charles Darwin as he travelled the world. And it's actually the horrors of nature which eroded uh, Darwin's belief in the benevolent God of Victorian Christianity. And he could not re reconcile together a benevolent God and a malevolent creation. Uh, Cornelius Hunter, he's a researcher and he's written some books, and he argues that Darwin's work was actually profoundly theological from its very inception. Like, we think, oh, he's doing scientific work. He's actually doing theological work, believe it or not. And he was actually constructing a theodicy. And he comes up with really good uh, evidence for this. And a theodicy is where you, you, you're trying to reconcile God and evil together in the same world. And so this is one of the things Darwin was actually um, uh, aiming to do. And what he, 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 through natural selection, he was able to create distance between God and the horrors 
of um, nature. Now, th this may sound strange to you, but uh, Darwin was actually, a, he was aiming to be a clergy naturalist. That was his goal. So he, he'd studied theology, and um, basically he wanted to become an Anglican parson, so he could do very little at church, and then <laughs> spent the rest of his time <laughs> studying nature, and a lot of because there was a lot of guys doing that at the time. Um, and the theory of evolution was one way that uh, you could actually say that God did not directly create waste, cruelty, and death. Rather, that was the blind laws of natural selection. Um, see, uh, Darwin came from a Unitarian family, and just before he went, he sort of managed to move himself to bit of an Anglican, very liberal uh, Anglican, but after his trip um, around the world he drifted into a deist-like agnosticism. And of course uh, later students of Darwin were, would fail to see how you can reconcile the horrors of the natural world with a, any creator at all and you, you get a, a lot of strident and vocal um, atheism. Um, here's, here's a quote by a later um, evolutionist, the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive, many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear, others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites, thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst and disease. And then he continues on and he says, The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we would expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And uh, whatever you think of Richard Dawkins, he's an exceptional writer. And so this is the conclusions that a lot of people draw from observing um, evil in nature. And so uh, what, what happens is we, if, we, if we look all about this and we look at our question, the moral implications of death before sin, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're looking at an issue of theodicy. Okay, how, how do we reconcile God and the, the current state of the natural world? Something that Richard Dawkins is not interested in, but theistic evolutionists are, and they have to face <coughs> this. Because Genesis seems to affirm a creation that is sinless and, and free of death and, and suffering and cruelty and so forth. And that um, once sin takes place, these things are introduced into the world. But uh, obviously, if you're a theistic evolution, ev ev evolutionist, this is reversed. Because um, from the get-go, death is actually uh, a part of the natural world. And in fact, it's a key driver. It's, you, you cannot have any evolution happening unless you've got continual um, death taking place. So what are the moral implications of this? And this question can be taken in several ways. Um, the one I particularly will focus on and look at is, is actually what are the moral implications for God? So we could look at for humans, and maybe I'll mention something at the end, but what are the moral implications um, for God? And so we, we come to these um, theodicy questions, and we can do different uh, forms of these. Um, you know, if God is, is good, how could he ordain a process of creation that is built on constant death and suffering and violence and cruelty, which is inherent to evolution? And so we might, might say, is this kind of God, the God of evolution, morally consistent with the Bible's story and its moral claims? Um, is this kind of God morally consistent with the morality of the God of the Bible? Um, and is it morally consistent with um, Jesus? We are asked these questions. And... Uh, it creates a bit of a dilemma in a sense, and um, this. So we can then uh, put it this way, um, and this is a comeback to theistic evolution. So if God is all good, then He would not have created this way. This is what people ask. You know, if He's good, why would He choose this manner of bringing about life? So. People raise that issue. And if God is all powerful, he need not have created this way. Like what sort of limits and constraints on him the, if, if you affirm that he's all powerful? So this, these are raising problems and, and issues. And if God is all wise, then he could have created in a different manner, in a superior or kinder manner. So the, these are some of the questions that um, can, 
confront um, theistic evolution if you affirm this sort of thing. Um, so now these are potential implications and what theistic evolutionists would say that these are true, this is potentially an implication, but they deny this is the actual implication and they have to. And they struggle with this and, and they really, really struggle with this. This is actually the big uh, problem for them. And uh, they don't, they come up with lots of different um, responses and it's not all consistent so it's sometimes hard to analyse. Um, so I'll, I'll just throw out a few of um, the responses that sort of come and go, you might read, and, and how uh, theistic evolutionists try to deal with this, because um, it's a very high stakes problem. So I'll just run through, and some of these are stronger or weaker than others. Um, one, they, they actually they take the free will argument, which concerns moral evil, which we use. So we say, look, God is not to blame for moral evil if this person kills or murders or anything like that. Because God has given human beings free choice. So you're all familiar with this, isn't it? This is the free will defense. So um, theistic evolutionists try and take this and they cr you can call it a free process defense. And they say, well, you know, God has set up uh, nature, with, uh, creation with its own autonomy and so forth. And so um, as a, just part of that, um, you've got to have chance and indeterminacy and nature. And so things can go wrong. So... Um, you know, you can be walking along and a rock will fall on you and kill you. And it's, no one's to blame, it's just a part of the process of nature. And, and just earthquakes happen. And, and so, and this is probably one of their strongest arguments that they can come up with. It's just part of having this natural world which has its own sort of autonomy in a sense to, to do things. Um, so that's probably the, the, the strongest one. Another one is, is um, often combined with this. Well, it's like God has really no other way of going about and uh, bringing about, say, his goal for creation, which might be human beings. So um, to get human beings, he's got to start life and eventually it will develop and will come to, to human beings. And there's no other way to produce a, an interesting world where you can get these uh, moral human beings. They argue lots of different ways. Maybe you need a world which has suffering so people can learn to be compassionate and, and things like this. Um, and a world without suffering and death is an uninteresting world um, where there's no challenge. So you'll read lots of different things. And they usually combine it with a greater good defense. And they say, well, look, this is, this is justified because, yeah, okay, the process doesn't look that nice. But the end result is very good because he's going to bring about um, human beings who can know him and worship him. And so the greater good uh, is justifiable. That's the reason why you, you have the not so good. Okay, so that's a very, very common one. And, and oh, sorry. Um, this next one is, is quite significant, actually. It's a kenosis theory. Um, and what they do, and I, I noticed this quite a lot, because um, they're on the back foot. They are in this area, they are on the back foot in discussion with creationists. Because creationists are like, we don't have a problem in this area. This is your problem. And so they try and draw on some theological resources. So uh, in Philippians 2, you know that beautiful poem, hymn, song about Jesus, who, how he leaves heaven. He leaves and he becomes one of us. And it, it's got the phrase where, you know, it starts off, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who though in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something to be grasped or hold, held onto, but made himself a servant in death. And, and now the word says uh, he emptied himself, right? The Greek word is kino. So you get the word of the idea of kenosis or a kenotic theory um, of, of Christ. And, and so Jesus empties himself for us. He, He's going to sacrifice himself for us. And this is what he does, isn't it? Well, it's interesting what the theistic evolutionists do. They say, um, all of nature is canotic. Okay, so um, all of nature is cruciform. All of nature is Christ-like. And you're like, okay. And what they're trying to say is, this process which you, you, you think is so horrible you know, it's one animal giving up its life 
for the species, for other animals. So it's, it's sacrificial, you know, it's, it's kenosis is happening. In, in, so they're saying it's, it's a very pious theological idea and it's, it's one of their um, most important theological ways they, they justify this. Um, yeah, one organism sacrifices itself for the next in the upward march of evolution. Now, it's, it sounds quite nice, doesn't it, in some ways? Um, evolution is Christ-like, but it's actually terribly flawed, and it's a misuse of a very special, precious theological idea to justify a theological scientific problem which is in deep trouble. Okay? And here, here's, the, here's the issue, here's the problem. When you look at nature, you do not see, except in very rare, rare cases, um, Christ-like or canotic behaviour. You see it in in-group, um, in the in-group, say a particular group of animals will look after each other and even sacrifice themselves sometimes. You, you see that, but you don't see it out-group. And what, what the norm is in nature is that animals don't lay down their lives for other animals. The warthog doesn't happily jump into the jaws of a tiger, does he? No, the warthog runs and he fights desperately to save his life, her life, or their offspring. And it's, it's desperate, you, you, you know, you've seen the documentaries. Um, the, and the tiger stalks and then rips, tears and takes the warthog's life. This is not kenosis, it's the, it's the opposite. The, the, the warthog is fighting for his life. And the, the tiger's going to take it from him. There, there's no Christ-like laying down here. So um, this, is, this is actually theological romanticism. <coughs> trying to romanticize some elements of nature. And, uh, but it's a, it's a thing that is often used. There's the appeal to mystery. We don't know why God did it this way, but he definitely did it this way. Okay, appeal to mystery. There's the minimization strategy. And this is um, quite common. And this is like... Uh, look, animals experience pain, but they don't suffer. Animals are more like automations or machines, right? Um, they, they can't experience suffering, only pain. So when your toaster is destroyed, right, do you go, oh, my toaster, this is terrible. Did you see what happened to that toaster? Well, maybe if it was an expensive toaster. But you don't feel moral empathy with your toaster, do you? Okay, but um, we often do with uh, animals. But uh, what they have to say is, look, you're anthropomorphizing animals. You think they're suffering, they're not, they're just feeling pain. And I, I think the evidence is growing all the time that that's not true. Animals seem to have a higher, higher, form, higher life forms, have an amazing capacity um, for suffering. And, and, and you take a calf away from, its, from a cow. You watch elephants mourn the loss of one of their group. Um, so I think this is hard to um, justify. The, another obviously very um, common thing is just to say, look, creationism is absurd and there's different ways to do this, but in terms of uh, death, they say, well, you know, a world without death, imagine what that would be. Bacteria endlessly multiply, trees endlessly grow, animals end endlessly multiply, and eventually we'd all just be sort of like moving around, excuse me, excuse me, because, you know, there's no death. Okay. Now this is a bit of a this is a bit of a caricature. No, no creationists actually sort of believe that. One of the, one of the things I'll just point out um, is what what Genesis says is that there's no death for nephesh in the Hebrew, no death for like things that are living beings, and that's actually not all um, life. A a plants are not nephesh. Plants can die. Well, in, in the Bible, plants are never described as dying. They just wither or whatever, or they can come back. Um, so death is not related to plants, you know, this death that results from sin. And um, it, it concerns humans and higher animals. And uh, creationists differ as, like, what is, what is nephesh and what is not nephesh? Okay, so there's some... We're not, not sure, but it's quite possible that insects are, well, they, they don't, they're not knee fish. So, yeah, maybe Adam stood on an ant and killed it. That would not violate um, the issue of death before sin. So there's a little bit of debate there. 
But the idea is that the higher life forms, and, uh, humans and, and higher animals who, who have the capacity to feel and suffer, none of them die in the, the world God creates. But plankton, yeah, plants, yeah, they, that's not a problem. Uh, the other one is the tuquoque fallacy. So this is um, French. And it means you too, you also. So um, basically what is it if, if we say to theistic evolutionists, you have a problem because uh, you've got death before sin and, and this death is the way God does everything. And uh, look at all this animal suffering. And this response is just to say, well, you've got the same problem, to quote we, you two. And what they're saying is, well, animals die because of Adam's sin and God allows that to happen. Okay, so that's, it's not, it's, it's not really an argument, it's just saying, oh, you, you've got a similar problem as well. I think the problems are different, they're not the same sort of thing, you're not describing the same sort of thing, but um, just, I'll keep going just because of time. Now, um, uh, what I'm going to do, in order to just bring this out, right, the moral implications of death before sin, is compare, it's always good to compare, it helps, uh, four positions. Um, now what I'm going to do is, let's, moral implications of death, and let's remove sin. Forget sin, forget the fall. And if we do that, and just throw it out, we can actually look at what, is, what does it look like, morally, the way death functions in these different systems. Okay, and hopefully the, um, you'll see what I'm doing. And we're going to look at three things. Now, um, God, the creation process, and the product, right? And the idea here is we should be, these should all align rationally, logically, but also morally. And if they align morally, at least you, you've got a, something consistent here. Okay? So the first one is special creation. And you've got a um, morally perfect, all-powerful God. And then the creation process, initially there's, there's no death. So this is before sin. Okay? So there's no death, there's no suffering, it's non-violent, no predation or cruelty. And the product is the image of God, moral image of God, understands morality. And again, no death or suffering for this moral image. Now, so this is, forget sin, right? And it's consistent, isn't it? Morally consistent, rationally consistent. So that's not a problem. I, I want to introduce you briefly to maybe a form of theism you don't know about. But a lot of, um, this is not theistic evolution. It's very close. But um, this is process theism. And this is actually, if you want to believe in evolution and God, this is the most consistent position. Right? There's a big cost to it, but this is actually the one that works. So, process theism and is, you believe that there's a God, but he's a finite God. Now, he's good, but he's not all-powerful. And there's, there's a lot of people who believe this, a lot of theologians. And um, he's good, and so because he's good, he's seen as an empathetic God. He's the supreme fellow sufferer. Um, but he's powerless to help you. Okay? He's finite. The reason he's powerless is because, although he's eternal, he didn't create matter. Matter is actually eternal. So it has its own power. operates according to its own nature. What this means is, this God can only have influence by persuading, by trying to influence so he actually persuades atoms, and atoms can actually go their own way. And what this God is trying to do is persuade matter into higher forms, right? And so it evolves. So the creation process um, of evolution is through unavoidable death and suffering. So you see, you cannot blame this God. Sure, there's death, but it's not his fault, is it? Because he can't do anything about it. Um, and the end product is, well, maybe it's he's trying to get something like him, morally, an image of God. But, and this is where maybe he is a bit culpable, he or she or it, is as he helps creation develop, with increasing development and potential, it means the creation is increasingly potentially good, but it's also increasingly potentially bad, and he's got no control over that. So you might say, well, you're culpable of actually trying to 
help creation become more complex. You know. But he's like, I couldn't do anything about it. Now, would you worship this God? Okay. But this is actually consistent. This is a consistent position. And then put up this one, naturalistic um, evolution. This is morally consistent. No God, no morality. And evolution is an amoral process of life and death. No one, there's no one to blame. Um, and the end product, well, it's a blind process. There's no goal. Um, but eventually you do get um, sentient beings. And morality is actually just subjective. Now, this is often where they become inconsistent. There's some naturalists who want to have uh, morality, which is binding, but there's no way to justify it, right? It's just good advice or helpful advice or maybe will help flourishing sometimes. But you don't have to follow it. Okay, now I'm going to put up theistic evolution, but this is not what I think it actually is. But this is uh, what sometimes is claimed and this is a, a, maybe a positive way of putting it. So here you, you have a morally perfect, all-powerful God. And theistic evolutionists, a classical theist, they want to say this. They want to say this. Now, what is evolution? Well, again, it depends on who you're reading, but some want to say it's a good process of progress via yeah, death, suffering, predation, violence, and pain. But it's, it's a good process because it's heading somewhere. And then you've got this morally good humanity. Again, they sometimes they go different ways on this. Made in the image of God as the climax of evolution. Okay. Now, looking at that, you think, oh, maybe it's morally consistent, but there's, it's starting to get a problem. That's why I put the good in um, quotation marks and so forth. But what should be able to happen? We can start anywhere and go move to either side, and it should be all consistent. It's actually an impersonal, amoral process of progress via death, suffering, predation, violence, and pain, just by when you look at it. And of course, some of them say, well, there's no animal suffering. That's all projection. Um, but that's also, maybe I'll mention later on, that's a concerning implication as well. So if this is what the process is like, this is actually who the God actually is. And, and, and um, Sven sort of touched on this. You have an all-powerful, amoral God. That's what I'd argue. And I think he is deistic, but um, again, theistic evolutionists are very inconsistent. He's like, they have a deistic God, deistic God, deistic God. Jesus turns up, we have an intervention, interventionist God. And you're like, wow, that's really inconsistent. But I've put here, he's at least emotionally deistic. Even if you want to bring Jesus in and you say, no, God can work miracles, he can intervene. Well, he sat around for half a billion years while animals <laughs> suffered. That's at least emotionally deistic. He's, he's very distant from this. Morally indifferent to the animal world. And he's a creator orchestrator. He sort of starts stuff and he sort of orchestrates the process. Okay? And then you get um, problems at the end. So the end goal, product, you have ma humanity made in the image of a God who used death, pain of the animal creation to produce that humanity. And then the implication, they also want to argue humans must not operate in the same moral manner as, as God has operated. in, Because the big problem here is, and I've sort of left my notes, um, what you have is a God who appears to be, he uses nature in an interim, um, instrumentalist manner. Right. And morally, this is, a, this is a problem because... What that means is God is, this God is a cons consequentialist. Okay. In other words, right and wrong is determined by the outcome, not by moral principles. So God does things because the outcome is going to be good. Because the outcome is, is going to be good, it justifies him doing this. Now this is moral instrumentalism. This is actually the end justifies the mean. So right, what is right and wrong is not based on moral principles. It's based on the outcome. Now, that's what the God of evolution appears to be. The problem is, Scripture and theism is not um, morally uh, consequentialist or teleological. It's what they call deontological of some kind. That is, God 
operates according to moral principles. Now, I would say it's his own character. <clears throat> so it's not the outcome which determines what is right and wrong. It's who he is, and he operates consistently with himself. But theistic evolution seems to present you who a God who, for, who at the end justifies the means. Because he wants to get humanity who's going to worship him. And the process of getting there is, well, a lot of cost to a lot of species. I think 90% of species have, is extinct, if you look at the fossil record and everything. Billions upon billions, trillions of animals, millions of years of suffering to pr produce this. And so that, that is, um, that is a, a disturbing thing. That, so that's a disturbing moral implication. Now, um, what you get then is you have the problem that you actually have two gods in theistic evolution. And, and when you read them, you'll, you'll find, they won't admit that, but you find this constant clash between the God they need to affirm theistic evolution and then Jesus Christ and the God of Scripture. And it seems they're always clashing up. And you can't combine the two. And when you do, one of them suffers. And it's the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture um, suffers. So, um, just looking at the time, just a couple of minutes. So, now I haven't mentioned uh, special creation, uh, progressive creationists. They have their own unique issues here. Um, maybe in questions and answers, um, we can look at that. And um, I'll just because uh, I've got two minutes. Okay. A few other moral implications. Um, a major issue for theistic evolution is why is it that redemption appears to be the undoing of God's work? Which is really odd. Remember, redemption and theistic evolution aims to end God's process of death, violence, predation, and cruelty. Because often they're like, yeah, eschatologically, eventually things will be nice. And, and Jesus comes to get rid of death. And you're like, so Jesus is coming to get rid of what <coughs> he started anyway. And you're like, that, that's odd. Whereas in the creationist position, redemption is the restoration of creation. It's, it's consistent there. It's not its undoing. It's bringing creation back to what it was and then perfecting it even, even more. Um, and creation, some evolutionists say, no, no, well, redemption perfects this process God started and then and you ask well why why was its start so tragic and horrific why couldn't the uh, immature creation be immature and innocent why does it have to be so vicious um, the other thing is if we're made in the image of god what do we do when we see animal suffering uh, so my my moral um, equipment we all have it in our head. Is it reading things wrong when we, we see the zebra? And we're like, oh, that's horrible. Now, am I, uh, am I um, is it just a physical reaction I'm having? It's like, oh, that tastes bitter. You know? Is it like that? Or have I morally assessed the situation with my moral faculties? And it's like, that is disturbing. That's not right. Now, is that telling me the right thing? Or is there something wrong with my moral faculties? So, because when I look at theistic evolution, my moral faculties say, there's something wrong with this God. And so, you know, it's, this is another moral implication, like, do we trust this? What, are, are we reading things rightly? And that's, that's why, you know, it's like, ah, oh, animals don't feel pain. They're trying to, <laughs> they're actually trying to tame what I'd say is something that they know intuitively Something is wrong here. Okay, so you know, see the moral implications, they actually keep, they start adding up. Yeah, but I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you for our, both of our excellent presentations by these two theologians this morning, this afternoon. Uh, we'll take some questions now. I presume there might be one. I see several. Where is our, there we go. Thank you. Uh, thanks. This is to Sven, please. Um, right at the beginning of your introduction to the talk, I kind of got the impression that you're saying that there is no science or scientific evidence that can give us an assurance of creation. 
Um, did I understand that right? Um, I guess in the context of the conversation, it's not about scientific evidence, as you can't decide whether there is evidence for creation. Does that... Is sure, so, so the question is, just the first question is, there's no scientific evidence for creation. Well, I'm just wondering if there is, because from what you were, from my understanding of what you were saying, that it's very hard to, to show evidence of creation in, okay. in the scientific field world that we have it as... as sure. So, no, it's a, it's a good what question. What I'd say is there's, there's different... Um, it, it links back to a question we had yesterday from the, um, uh, one of the pastors here. And, and that is that um, there, there's different kind of levels of, of creation or, or sort of details of creation, maybe I could say, um, that, that we have and, and that would point to a, a creator. Um, so, for example, um, the Bible uh, teaches that the universe has not always existed. It had a beginning. And we see that with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, basically, that the, the world is slowly winding down. And um, if, if time had been going on for all affinity, then it should have already reach, reached a, a um, level or a state of equilibrium. So that takes us back uh, to a point where someone established uh, the, the initial state of entropy um, and that points us back to a cause for uh, for the universe. So that's the first thing. And certainly uh, you can also, if you believe in the Big Bang, uh, you can also use the, the fact that the Big Bang points towards a singularity and a beginning of the universe as, as well. Um, and of course you need to assess whether you, the evidence for the Big Bang is, is uh, sufficient. Um, so, so that certainly points to the, the original cause. Um, but that, that is not a complete picture of God. It points to a powerful cause of the universe, but it doesn't point to uh, the, the, the God of the Bible. So, then, so that's the first level. We can look at the laws of physics, which, which point to a, a rational God who creates the universe according to an orderly um, structure and also our minds to understand the universe. So that's, that points to the rationality of God. Uh, so that's the next level. Um, and, and then we can start looking at some of the evidence for intelligent design, the, the information in the cell. And what I'm saying is this, is if you are looking for scientific evidence that God created uh, all of the, the animal and plant kingdom uh, in six literal days using a series of miracles, uh, science, because for pragmatic reasons, uh, is looking for natural laws. That, that is what you can't find using, uh, you know, you can't prove that level of, of creation. That's what I'm saying. This is for Sven again. Um, you might need to refer back to the slides for this one, but on the second last slide that you showed, in the conclusion, um, it mentioned something about um, six-day creation and I think it was like deep time evolution. Yep. Theory. I didn't quite understand that conclusion. Can you just like re-explain it, please? Uh, let me just see if I can get back uh, here. So, okay, so. Okay. Is that one? No. That one. Before. Okay, the endorsement of both a recent six-day creation and deep time origins will undermine the effectiveness of our witness. Um, basically, what that's, that's saying is, is look, we as, as a church uh, have been called to witness to the creator of the Bible. Um, you, we find that in Revelation 14, uh, 6 to 7. And, and once we start getting a, a hybrid... Uh, kind of witness. We're actually, as what both Anthony and I was saying, we're actually um, pointing to p people to two different pictures of God. It, it really waters down um, our, our witness. And, and certainly, um, if, if our confidence in, in God of the Bible and as a creator is, 
is minimized, and that's what deism does. It, it minimizes the picture of God. Uh, then then it, it undermines our confidence and our um, effectiveness in, in witness. And this is what we do find, because I've, I, I talk to people who believe in theistic evolution and progressive creationism as well. And uh, one of the things that they will say is, well, we both believe in creation. We both believe in the doctrine of creation. Uh, but the fact is this, it, it sounds like it's something uniting us, but we actually believe in different doctrines of creation because their doctrine of creation is that God created the universe and then the universe continued on. My uh, picture of creation is that God is intimately involved, just like uh, when Jesus came to this earth and, and he started his public ministry, he was healing people, he was casting out demons, he was walking on water, he was turning water into wine. Um, and, and so you go back to the biblical account of creation, God was speaking and things were being created. Uh, first day, second day, third day. It's, it's, a, it's a bursty creation uh, picture. So, so we're not actually dealing with the same doctrine of creation. We're dealing with different pictures of God creating. And, and, and our, our witness will be compromised by that, that difference. Okay. Here we go. Anthony, I know you're right here and I've got the microphone. It's a bit weird again. But uh, just a quick question. Uh, seeing as both of you ran out of time and both of you were just getting to progressive creationism, I was wondering, what is it? And a second, a, a quick second question, uh, briefly, why do animals suffer? If Adam ate, you know, if Adam just ate the fruit, uh, you know, is it is it because Adam is now selfish and doesn't, you know, care for the animals anymore, or is it something else? Is it arbitrarily imposed on animals? As God just went, okay, well. You know, I'm lifting my hand off that now. You know, you guys sort it out yourselves. Why, why do we believe animals suffer? What was it that brought that about? Well, maybe I'll, I'll answer that one. And, uh, Sven can do the first one. Um, yeah, so this is the Tukwoki response as well. Um, theistic evolutionists will say, hey, God lets animals suffer. And, and it, is, it is a problem. But the, the, is, is it that... The problem is that God has deliberately brought this about, which is the theistic evolution problem, or is it because of the tragedy of sin? And so what I would say is the way God has created the world is God is God. He exists by himself, as himself, not dependent on anything. But all of creation exists interdependently. So when God created the world, um, and some of the guys have referred to this, every single element of creation is linked to every other single other element of creation is dependent on it. And then within this, because it's God's world that he makes, um, he puts his image on it. If he didn't put his image in, then this would not be a world like that really reflected him. So he puts his image as the, the top, the head, but that image is, is from the ground and also has like, life from him. So we stand in between. We're the only thing that stands in between. We are, we're just like the world. We're, we're from the ground. But we're actually like God. But what happens is um, the whole destiny of, of that world is linked to us. Whatever way the head goes, the, the planet goes, the animals go. And, and so um, when, when we sin, when we fell... Uh, you cannot separate us from the world. Like, was God going to go, okay, I will take you, I'll plonk you on the moon, and I'll let all the animals just go as it being nice and, and peaceful. Well, um, we would die. <laughs> and, and then that creation is no longer the creation which has God's image who exercises dominion in that. So that's why Paul says, um, God subjected creation, but in hope. And it's waiting. It's groaning, and it's waiting because when, and, and so Jesus is going to come, he's going to come as the second Adam to save us and creation. So it's our fault that create, animals suffer. And Jesus, he's going to redeem us, so, you know, our redemption. But he also wants to redeem animal creation. And that's why in, in the Torah, God has rules about animals, how you treat animals. And there's, like, the, what's that little 
um, I think I'm sure Jacques Gautin, Dukan could talk about this little law about um, is it taking a, a, an egg from the nest of a bird. And there's a rule, like, basically, don't distress the mother if you're going to do it. And it's, it's like, wow, why is God so concerned about this? And Jesus says, hey, well, your father, he, he's noticed every single sparrow that has fell. And Ellen White talks about how the whole of creation, not just humans, but everything, it's, she says it's like a, a laser house or a leper's house. And, and God's been watching this the whole time, and he's suffered the whole time with this. So uh, we are interconnected. There, there's no other possibility. But, and, but the good thing is, when by Jesus becoming what we were supposed to be, the, the head, uh, the true image, and redeeming all of us, he's going to rescue all of creation. Yeah. Okay, so a quick summary of what our, the rest of our talks are going to be. Yes, progressive creationism. Yes, so, so progressive creationism is this, is that people look at science and uh, they'll look at cosmology um, and in particular geology. Uh, they, they will see that the, uh, the dating mechanisms for, for rocks and um, sediments and things like that um, are pretty solid, uh, rock solid, and uh, they <laughs> and, and, uh, using radiometric dating and things like that. And so they will say, okay, well, that's axiomatic, as, as Des Ford said. It's axiomatic. We, we just start with that assumption. We take it as a given. Okay, so then, then they'll look at the, um, uh, the rest of the fossil record. Uh, they'll, they'll see that there's this huge, big um, quantum the gulf between you know, the primordial soup, the hypothesized primordial, uh, primordial soup, and the first living cell. And so they'll say, obviously, we need a miracle at that point. They'll look at the Cambrian explosion and see all of these different animal body parts and species coming, and, and that happened very quickly, so we need some... Um, so God intervenes at, at different points along the way. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's progressive creationism. Uh, so quickly, some of the implications and problems with progressive creationism. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to question uh, whether, whether geological dating methods are actually uh, telling us the truth about the history of our world. Uh, are, they, um, are the assumptions being made um, actually, actually true? And, and there's reasons why they, they are not. Um, so so that's, the, that's one of the points. Um, a big issue uh, for progressive creationism is the animal death, which just like theistic evolution is occurring for uh, millions of years. Uh, so same, same problem. Um, also the, the issue of uh, the Sabbath, the historical basis for, for the Sabbath has gone as, as well. Um, so while it doesn't have as many of the theological problems um, of, of theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism, it still has many of the really substantial uh, problems. And, and that's right. And, and the big issue is that, that axiomatic taking geological uh, dating models as, as a given um, and, and as cosmology. Well, let's, let's go back and is, does science always arrive at truth? Uh, you know, science is provisional. It's, it's based on assumptions. And, and um, we need to question those assumptions. So. Thank you. Right, question over here. Uh, one for you, Sven, if I may. Um, you mentioned in your talk, beginning of your talk, you're comfortable with the long age of the universe and the young age of the solar system. And I think we may have dialogued on this in the past, but... Sure. I'm, I'm just thinking through some of the implications of that. Uh, in the Bible, we read about the heavens disappearing in an instant, the heavens being rolled up as a scroll. Professor Stephen Hawkins himself says that the laws that govern our universe are so finely tuned that the slightest change to it would result in the universe, as we know it, collapsing or disappearing in a nanosecond. I wonder what implication that has for Christ's second coming and the heavens disappearing with a roar, and our understanding of this earth being recreated, recreated, and our, our belief through the writings of Alan White that there are other worlds out there. So I just wonder what, if you yeah, thought sure. about that at all. Yeah, sure. So, so certainly um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the, the universe is, is necessarily uh, very long, the, the age of the universe. Um, it could be varying different ages depending on when God created it. 
Um, but in terms of, you know, in terms of the fine tuning of the universe, well, God could could miraculously um, create a universe uh, with the with the parameters it needs um, at intermediate stages along the way, and that's exactly what Stephen Hawking said um, as as well. Um, so, uh, so we're not limited to to the age of the universe as given by the Big Bang. Um, in terms of the the future. Um, uh, what we what we can see there is God. Um, God can recreate this this earth and as much of the uh, neighbor, neighboring uh, you know uh, cos cosmic subspace and and recreate that. Um, he doesn't necessarily need to, to recreate uh, the entire entire universe, which would allow other um, intelligent beings to be on other planets. In, in the rest of the universe. So, but, but let me say that that is a, a question we'll be de uh, dealing with in four years' time. And uh, so, so make sure you register for that. Uh, we'll give you a, a um, discount code. So. All right. Uh, okay. Who's the question for? I am directing this to Anthony. Um, this is a, just, a, uh, just to say um, thank you for pointing out the, um, the responses that, uh, that's found under each of these different theistic, I mean evolutionary um, um, classes there. I'm especially um, um, learning again for the first time here um, and I believe a lot of my colleagues will also agree. Um, there are many things that we confuse um, as belonging to the, the creationist model, which really does not fit. And I think you pointed out some of those, uh, such as the kenosis theory, um, uh, the no other way, um, greater good. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so just to clarify, the, this, the, there is um, no way that uh, we can see um, the revelation of God's love displayed in uh, the natural world. Um, just, just so we, we're clear, there's a fine line there, I think, that if you can... Yeah, that's a that, fan yeah. fantastic um, issue to raise. Um, so we, we, we do believe in the two books. There's the Bible, there's one book, a revelation, and then there's nature, which is another revelation of God. And we do believe that creation reveals God. Um, now, the problem with, say, Darwin is he believed in natural theology. So he constructed his idea of God. Natural theology constructs their idea of God by studying the natural world. Okay, and that's why deism arose. Because it's like they can look at nature and they go, well... Pretty good evidence that there's a first cause, there's a creator. Yep, it's there, so you can see that. But um, our theology of, of creation is not natural theology. We want to go to scripture. And so what scripture does is it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay? And they show the glory about God, but they, scripture also says, because of the fall and sin, there's another principle at work within God's created world. So when you look at the created world, you're actually, you're seeing a revelation of God, but you're also seeing the effects of sin. Um, and, and that's why nature on its own will not um, give you a knowledge, a tr true accurate knowledge of God. It gives you a partial knowledge, and, and Paul in Romans 1 tells you, you see his divine power and eternal power, his Godhead. So you see there is a God, a very powerful God. But that's actually what nature tells you. It doesn't say, tell you that he's Jesus Christ. So we need scripture to clarify how to interpret the natural world. So the two books are uneven. Right? The, the, the scripture is the key book, which actually helps you interpret the second book, the book of nature. So it's a fantastic question. It's very important because a lot of people um, have actually come to very bad conclusions about God because they've looked at nature and like Darwin, they're like, oh, this is horrible. I see, you know, it's beautiful and then it's horrible. Boy, what is this God like? So fantastic question. Uh, this is a question for Sven. Um, early in your talk, you spoke about the Adventist views on hell. Now, I grew up as a Catholic, 
living in absolute terror of going to hell. And it really was a really hard time. And now you're just totally blowing all of that out of the water. What is, the, I'm not an Adventist obviously, what is the view that Adventists have of hell? I mean, this could be quite transforming for, <laughs> for most of Christianity, I think. <laughs> Look, um, uh, I, would, I would really recommend that you get either a book or the movie called The Fire That... Well, the book is called The Fire That Consumes and the, um, the movie is called Hell and Mr Fudge. And, and great. And, and he's not actually an Adventist pastor or theologian. He was someone who went on the journey. And um, what we have discovered as we have studied the, the Bible um, down through our, the history of our denomination is that we have recognised that um, for a long period of time, Christianity has really bought into uh, Greek philosophy and dualism. So, so um, spirit and, and body, good and, and evil. And one of the consequences for that, and the, the spirit um, is, is eternal. Um, and so the idea is that each one of us have an immortal soul. Um, and what follows from that is this concept where um, if you choose to believe in Jesus, like I, I know you do, uh, Paul, uh, that, that you will be, you'll be taken to heaven. And in that theology, um, heaven is kind of spiritualized away. You know, we, um, we just go there with our, with our souls rather than as a holistic being with our physical, you know, body, mind and spirit and soul. Um, but then if you choose to reject Jesus um, and the salvation that God offers, then, then God will send you to, to hell where you're tormented for all of eternity. And as we have read scripture, uh, we have recognized that there, there's a different picture that's being portrayed. It's a, it's a um, Hebrew understanding of, of the nature of God. It's a holistic. And in that, uh, what will happen is that, that God gives us the choice. Do we want to live with him forever um, in the new heavens and the new earth? Um, or do we reject him? And if we reject him and we're disconnected from the source of life, we do not have an immortal soul. Uh, ultimately, we are just go into oblivion, so there is no eternal torment. Um, so it's simply, at the end, it's simply God living with those people who've chosen to accept his salvation. And um, honestly, Paul, um, it's, it's a fantastic Bible study, and, and I, would, I would recommend that you explore it because it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful understanding, and your, your picture of God uh, will be transformed forever. We might add that in Genesis, man was not given a soul. He was a soul. Man became a living soul when the physical was joined to the breath of life. Soul refers to the entire person. Thank you for your presentations, man. I just want to make a reflection on the classic philosophical debate of rationalism versus empiricism. Because rationalism basically says, you know, in my head, I think the world is like this. And empiricism goes out and says, what is the world actually like? <laughs> and you sort of need both. So I commend what you're doing here because I think you, know, you need to think through the theological implications of different models. But it's a little bit like in selected messages, you know, Ellen White says, don't criticize the Bible saying, I wish God had made it more perfect because God gave us the Bible we have for his reasons. I'm sort of wondering how far can you take this sort of reasoning where you go, well, you know, God must be like this and the world must be like this so that everything's theologically consistent and how much do we sort of need to go, what is the world like and how do we assess that into our system, if you know what I'm saying? Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'd love to, to be able to read through uh, Warranted Christian Belief with you, um, all 600 pages by Alvin Plantinga. Um, and, and what he um, says is that, is that our our cognitive faculties actually point us towards um, our, our creator God. Um, so 
um, he, he develops this really amazing argument called the evolutionary argument against naturalism, uh, which is that um, the, the combination um, of evolution and atheism is actually fundamentally irrational. Um, so, so that's really, so what he's saying is your cognitive faculties is a gift from God. Uh, it's been created by God. But the other thing is, as he goes on, he talks about how our cognitive faculties have been damaged by sin. And, and so that's where I see empiric empiricism and um, uh, rationalism as, as breaking down in terms of leading us to uh, the complete or, or truth regarding um, our origins, our spiritual state as well. And, and so um, Elvin Plantinga says that what we need is we need the Holy Spirit to come and to repair our cognitive faculties um, so that we can understand. We need a revelation of, of God as well. So we need, we need a supernatural work, and that was what I, what I started on Tuesday. We need the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to, to understand ourselves, to understand God, to understand the world around us and our origins. And we shouldn't necessarily just say it's um, empiricalism or rationalism, which will get us all the way. Because like in, in Galileo's day, he looks through the telescope and goes, oh, there's sunspots. And the thinking of the time was there can't be sunspots because God must have created the sun perfectly, so it couldn't have any spots on it. <laughs> you know, and eventually he convinced people, yeah, there are actually things as sunspots, and they go, oh, we have to modify our view of creation. You know, so I'm hearing you, like, reason alone is flawed, but if there isn't some dialogue between reason and scripture, then you're, you have no capacity to modify your understanding of scripture in any way. But ultimately what I'm saying is that the scripture is the, the final arbitrator. The, it, it ultimately we need enlightened rationality and, and divine revelation to be able to understand the world. We, we cannot make, make human rationality the, the arbiter in this process. Um, I, I, I actually, we, we do need um, empiricism, rationalism and then scripture and, and a dialogue as long as scripture is supreme. Because you say with Galileo, um, what it showed is the theology was, was actually uh, being constructed from Aristotle or it wasn't actually scripture. S scripture doesn't say the sun has to be a perfect, unblemished. But some ideas of perfection, which were in gr Greek ideas, were like the heavenly bodies needed to be perfect. So the, the, the empiricism helped to correct a faulty theology, yeah. right? Um, and, and actually also showed up, ah, that theology is not even in scripture to start with. Yeah. So I think it's the, absolute. we need all of them, dialogue, whatever. I suppose it's whether one of them is, is revelation or not and what role it plays. Yeah. Thank you. My question is for Anthony. It's a very, very simple question to start with. That question is, uh, Jesus in his uh, resurrected state ate fish. If we go to the stage of uh, moralising everything, then Jesus was immoral in terms of eating fish. Or are the rest of us immoral for eating meat? Well, <laughs> remember, um, Jesus came into a fallen world where sin has already uh, impacted everything. And so... God um, accommodates himself to this, this state. Um, and we see it with, uh, after, the, after the flood, God says, eat, eat animals. And I mean, I've gone to countries where they wouldn't have survived if they didn't eat animals. So Mongolia, you think, well, how do you survive here if you're going to be vegetarian? It's not possible over the centuries. So God knows what he's doing. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a sin to eat meat. Um, it's not a sin to, for, for Jesus to eat fish. And he accommodates himself. Um, these were fishermen, whatever. So there's, there's no sort of... I, I mean, I'm not saying that animals have the same moral status as human beings. But I'm, I'm saying they actually have a moral status. And that before sin, uh, the fall, which complicates everything, the issue is 
why would God set up a process where all of these animals are going to suffer endlessly you know, for, for so long and, and then v eventually he'll actually reverse all this um, and, and sin, you, because sin doesn't bring this about, you can't say it was due to Adam or it's due to Satan or whatever, it comes right back to God and so you've got to ask, well, why would God do that and what are the moral implications for that, so that's what I was exploring. But um, I live in the Pacific as well, and fish is pretty important in the Pacific. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. I see that it's uh, not even 20 minutes, less than 20 minutes till uh, the next appointment. We better <coughs> take our break, meet for the workshops. You know what workshop you've signed up for? Remember, Dr. Chadwick isn't here, so those of